One thing we discussed was the phase diagram of the O2, o, of the O2 model. And then we focused a little bit more on the Goldstone phase. And in the Goldstone phase, there were this uh, rather rich uh, physics. We had this vortex. And we saw some hints of gauge theory. And then we formalized this correspondence that the free compact scalar, which is the low energy effective field theory in the Goldstone phase, is in fact entirely equivalent to a free gauge field. So we see that in the long distance limit, uh, where the effective field theory on, the, on this side of the phase diagram is well approximated by a single number Goldstone particle, uh, the physics can be also captured by a free gauge field. And there is a dictionary between different elements. Many people ask me lots of questions over the break and also before the lecture. And some of these questions, I think, are kind of pertinent to everybody. So please uh, step up and ask question, more questions during the talk, because some of these questions are, I think, would be of interest to many people. And I don't have really time to repeat all of them. So it would be good to just ask them uh, in flight. OK. So now we're going to make a more dramatic claim uh, about so the idea is that we have some kind of hints of duality on this side of the correspond on this side of the phase diagram, but the idea would be to like try to extend it to the whole phase diagram, which is a genuine uh, non-supersymmetric duality, and the idea is that uh, intuitively, here we saw these vortices, which uh, reminded us of charged particles. But the vortices here were dynamical objects. You could create a vortex and an anti-vortex. It would cost you some energy, but you could create vortex-anti-vortex -vortex pairs from the vacuum, and they could move. So the idea is to add charged particles, because charges look like vortices. And so the idea is to try to add charged gauge particles to the, to the gauge theory side of the correspondence, and to try to see if we can land on our feet. So we start from the simplest thing, which is to add a single charged particle of charge one. So the Lagrangian is going to be one over two g squared d mu a nu minus d nu a mu squared. That's the gauge kinetic term. But now we have a new scalar field. And since I already used the notation phi for the scalar field in the O2 model, and since I use the notation phi hat for the operator that acts on the vacuum and creates uh, stable particles, I guess now I need a new notation for a scalar field. So I wonder what would that be? Uh, H? OK. So let's do dH squared and some potential for H. Now H. H is a complex. H is a charge one scalar field. So now you'll see uh, a non-supersymmetric duality appearing sort of out of this mess. And it has a really amazing properties that I'll explain. So it's a charge one scalar field, meaning that the derivative acting on H is nothing but the ordinary derivative minus I A H. Okay, the usual covariant derivative. And now we have to say something about the potential for H. And as before, well, it has to be gauge invariant. But as before, I'm going to truncate it, it at the quartic order. So we have M squared, but now it's a new M, so let's call it M twiddle squared. Uh, H squared plus some new lambda, H to the 4. Okay, so that's the model. So let's study the physics of this model. We already know a lot about the free gauge theory. And we have some intuition about uh, you know, charged particles coupled to gauge fields from uh, the books, from, under, from graduate courses. So let's try to analyze this model, making the same sort of uh, self-consistent assumption that can be verified at the end, that this is an irrelevant coupling, and everything depends only on this coupling. So we'll vary m twiddle squared and try to draw a phase diagram and see if we land on our feet. So that's going to be here. So we draw the same line, m twiddle squared. And we have to analyze the model in limits where it becomes uh, weakly coupled. 
<coughs> now, uh, here there is one uh, conceptual issue that I will get to at the end, which is that unlike the O2 model, which had one QWERTY coupling lambda, here there are two, there is G squared and lambda twiddle. So this is an interacting, this is an interaction parameter because if you normalize the gauge field canonically, this G pops out here. And so it leads to some interactions between the Higgs field and the gauge field. And likewise, this is an interaction. So you see that uh, these models are clearly not the same. They even have different number of parameters. They have a different number of degrees of freedom. They are not equivalent in any exact sense. But you'll see the duality that we'll discuss soon will be a long distance duality. I'll discuss the conceptual, this conceptual point soon. But for now, just uh, I wanted to say that the model becomes weakly coupled when m twiddle squared is much, much bigger than both lambda squared and a g to the 4. Oh yeah, lambda twiddle squared, thank you. So this is where the model is weakly coupled, when the scale is much, much bigger than on the interactions. Remember that we learned that when there is an interaction, then it leads to an expansion at long distances that's badly, badly, badly divergent. So we need to take this limit for the expansion to make sense. Okay, so what happens when m twiddle squared is huge and uh, let's start from positive. M twiddle squared is huge and positive. So somebody from this section, you haven't, nobody participated, no? No, here, okay, I'll compromise. Yeah, it's the same theory as before. So namely it's a free photon, okay? So here we have a free photon, that's our effective field theory because we just got rid of the Higgs. It's like people didn't know that there is a Higgs, uh, you know, when they discovered electrodynamics because it's heavy. You integrate it out, nobody cares, yeah? So at long distances you don't care. So there is a free photon and we have a dictionary here saying that free photon is exactly the same as spontaneously broken magnetic symmetry. So this model has a global symmetry, which is U1 magnetic, which is generated by the current one over two pi epsilon mu nu rho f nu rho. So this is the magnetic symmetry. This is an exact symmetry of this model, an exactly one symmetry. Now, I just want to make one remark, which I won't say again, that that model has O2 symmetry, so you might want the symmetries to be the same, just for starters, and here there is just a U1 symmetry at this point. So there is another Z2, which is called charge conjugation. So there is also charge conjugation, which takes the gauge field to minus itself and the Higgs particle to H dagger. And uh, that's how we get O2, because these two generators combine to O2. Anyway, so, uh, so in this phase we get a free photon, which is exactly the same as number Goldstone. And so it can be written as an effective filter that looks like F pi twiddle squared D theta squared. So we see something that we already saw here, but it appeared on the other side, huh? It appears on the wrong side of the phase diagram somehow. Anyway, now let's do the other limit of large negative m squared. At large negative m squared, this is also familiar from textbooks because the Higgs field then wants to condense and we have a Higgs mechanism. So when the Higgs field uh, condenses and there is a Higgs mechanism, the gauge field disappears, right? Like the W bosons, they become heavy. And so what remains at low energies? Nothing. So this is trivially gapped. However, I want to t tell you something nice about it. Well, in this side of the duality, the vortices for theta are not good and they correspond to charged particles. Well, let me just write it. Vortices for theta, vortices of theta, they are charged particles. But here, I want to say something more a bit about this phase. Remember that here, I made a little uh, note that in this, this trivially gapped phase, there was a ma massive charged particle, phi, and uh, it was a stable, uh, it's a stable resonance. It's the lightest particle in, in the theory. So what is the analog here? I want to discuss that a bit. It's an interesting problem. So uh, it's useful to try to write the Higgs field in terms of a phase and a radial mode. And so let's 
uh, write the Higgs field in terms of a phase, let's call it psi, and the radial mode. So uh, if you go to the deep into the Higgs phase, where the scalar field condenses, then uh, the only thing that remains is this guy, and the action is like a Stuckelberg action. So, so there is this uh, thing that you saw in Peskin and Schroeder, I'm sure. There is this Stuckelberg action, which looks like a deep psi minus IA squared. So that's the effective field theory at very long distances. I mean, it's a trivial theory. So saying that this is the effective field theory at long distances is kind of uh, void of content because this theory is completely gapped and trivial, as we said here. But this is a useful thing to write because it allows you to exhibit some vortices. So we can ask, remember that vortices for phi did not exist, they had infinite energy. But what about vortices for psi, which is the phase of the Higgs field? When a complex scalar field condenses, we already convince ourselves that there are no vortices. But the Higgs field is coupled to a gauge field, so maybe when, the Higgs field is when there is a scalar field that's coupled to a gauge field, then there are vortices. And indeed, the point here is that this previous computation that led to a logarithmic divergence is now uh, fixed. We can cancel the logarithmic divergence by picking an appropriate configuration for the gauge field. So if we go very far, we have some vortex core, and psi goes around and picks a 2 pi phase. But now we can pick a gauge field, little a, that goes like 1 over the distance, 1 over r, which is the distance from the core. So let's say that this is r. If we pick a gauge field, which goes like 1 over r, with, an, with a component in the, in the uh, polar angle, this will cancel this logarithmic divergence that we've previously encountered. And in fact, it will render the vortex into a genuine, now a genuine finite energy particle. So now there is a particle, which is called the magnetic vortex. This particle is called in the literature a magnetic vortex. The reason that it's called a magnetic vortex is that because you've activated the gauge field to cancel the logarithmic divergence, now this gauge field carries some flux. And you can check that, the, this, that this flux leads to a magnetic field. So the way it looks is like there is a, a basically a magnetic field through some uh, circle here. So the particle looks like a little tiny bit of magnetic flux that's moving around. So it's like a moving solenoid. Uh, so that's why it's called the magnetic vortex. And this particle carries the charges of the U1 magnetic symmetry. So there, this was a symmetry in the problem. And you can check that this, uh, if you integrate J0, you integrate J0, you get 1 in some units. Where J0 is defined as the zeroth component of the current, you compute the total charge. Since this particle carries magnetic field, it gives 1. Because J0 is nothing but the magnetic field in space. So the total magnetic field is, not, is 1 in some units. So we have a perfect candidate to mirror the stable particle created by an ordinary complex scalar field. That's the magnetic vortex. So we see essentially the same thing. A trivially gapped phase that maps to a number Goldstone phase. A U1, this is U1M charged. This is charged under U1 magnetic. On the, in the trivially gapped phase, we see a stable particle which is charged under the unbroken symmetry on both sides. Here it looks like a magnetic vortex, and there it looks like an ordinary particle, a phi to the four particle. That's why this is called particle vortex duality. Okay? There are two, it's very confusing because there are two kinds of vortices in this theory. There are bad vortices and good vortices, bad particles and good particles. The bad particles are the electrically charged ones, and the bad vortices are the vortices of the ordinary scalar field. The good particles are the phi particles, and the good vortices are these vortices. So it's very confusing. It's particle vortex duality, but it's really particle vortex duality for the good vortex and the good particle, not for the bad vortex and the bad particle. I'll write it more. We'll write the dictionary more. But in any case, you see the same phase transition. So you're compelled to say that this is also O2 Wilson Fisher universality class. Why not? It's, it's the same phase transition. So people, are base, so people were compelled to make this conjecture. And it's correct, it can be checked on the lattice. But this conjecture is not a, an exact duality. Now it comes, to, I want to come to two points. One is the dictionary, and the other is the nature, what is, does it mathematically mean for these models to be dual? 
So now we'll dedicate some time to the interpretation of this sort of duality. So I can erase that and write a more, now we can write a more sophisticated dictionary. So unlike the dictionary between the free photon and the compact scalar, this duality cannot be proven and nobody has proven it yet. It's something that's observed by doing theoretical tests and uh, a consistency checks. So one side of the duality is the gauge theory, which is uh, the kinetic term, one over two g squared f mu nu squared plus d h squared plus m twiddle squared plus lambda twiddle h to the four, m twiddle squared h squared plus lambda twiddle h to the four. That's one side. And the other side is d phi squared plus m squared phi squared plus lambda phi to the four. And now there is a dictionary. Now nobody can prove this duality, but we understand how various objects on one side map to various objects on the other side from this basic uh, consideration. But nobody has a full dictionary. It's an open problem and it might be unsolvable at this point. So let's start with the dictionary. First, it's always the symmetries. Symmetries are always the simplest. So the symmetry here is U1 magnetic and the conserved current is uh, one over two pi epsilon mu nu rho f nu rho. So the symmetries, this is the U1 symmetry of that side. I ignore charge conjugation. On that side we have SO2, which is the same as U1. And the current is uh, phi d mu phi star. That's the usual, exp phi star, sorry. So that's the usual expression for, the usual expression for the uh, particle number for a complex scalar field. So that's entry number one in the dictionary. Entry number two, the operators. Uh, so we see, we see that both have an O2 fixed point, but somehow it's reversed. The trivially gapped phase appears here on the right hand side and on the left hand side here. So it seems like the m squared parameter and m, squiddle, m twiddle squared are not quite the same. m squared couples to phi squared and m twiddle squared couples to h squared. So the next element in the dictionary is the relation between h squared and phi squared. And in this relation there is a funny minus sign. This minus sign is super crucial. That's the thing that tells you that the phase diagram is reversed in the duality. Now this may look disturbing because h squared and phi squared are positive. So how can it be that there is a minus sign? And uh, this is okay because these are composite operators. So the square of an operator in quantum field theory is not a positive definite operator. Okay. Next. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it, yeah. Yes. Yes. About what? Yeah, that's what I'm going to discuss, the meaning of this duality. I'm going to write a little bit the map, and when I finish writing the map, We'll discuss the physical meaning of this duality a little bit, okay? So, uh, uh, the next thing here is that uh, there is a monopole operator that we defined before. This monopole operator creates these magnetic vortices from the vacuum. So when the monopole operator acts on the vacuum in the trivially gapped phase, it creates magnetic vortices. On this side of the duality, it's clear what creates the stable particle in the trivially gapped phase, it's phi. So we have a mapping for phi. So you see phi squared maps to h squared, but you cannot take the square root of this formula because h doesn't exist, h is gauge variant. Phi, the thing that maps to the monopole operator, and phi squared maps to h squared, not to h. Sorry, so phi doesn't map to h. Phi squared maps to h squared, but phi maps to m because h doesn't exist. So this is the last element in the dictionary, but this is a questionable element. 
So this guy is uh, not really rigorous. It's just a qualitative thing. This is the bed vortex. You can also say that five vortices map to electric charges. Electric charges are H. It's not gauge invariant, so it's really kind of, I'm shaking just from writing it. But, uh, this is, but here we have the five vortex. So both objects don't exist. They have infinite energy, and they're not gauge invariant on this side of the duality. But they kind of are similar. So we still write, I, I'm, I can still mention it. Okay? So, so we have many elements that agree on the two sides. And, the phys and this is the central reason why it's called particle vortex, because this is a particle and this is a magnetic vortex in the trivially gapped phase. In the spontaneously broken phase, they both create Goldstone bosons. So it's trivial. But in the massive phase, it's a non-trivial mapping. Now about the meaning of this duality. That's what you asked about, right? Yes? Can you just pick up because I can't hear anything? That's right, yes. Yeah. So the fixed point here appears at some point, which is given by m twiddle squared in some units of g and lambda twiddle. And there the fixed point appears at some m squared, which is some number times lambda squared. But these numbers don't have to agree. And they're not universal. Because, OK, this comes to my next point, which is the meaning of this duality. So there is some kind of mapping. And the phase transition agrees. And so this is the simplest example of non-supersymmetric duality for an interacting field theory, yeah? This is supposed to be the simplest non-interacting, uh, simplest interact, sim simplest non-trivial, this is the simplest uh, non-trivial duality. And it's non-supersymmetric. That's the great thing about it. You might, may, maybe some of you are experts on supersymmetry and you might have thought that this concept is limited to supersymmetry. But as you see, it's not. Uh, there is a non-trivial, non-supersymmetric duality in two plus one dimensions. It's called particle vortex duality. And it's essentially proven on the lattice. And it passes a very large amount of consistency checks, theoretically. But I just wanted to explain what it means. So clearly, nobody says that these two models are the same. In fact, these two models don't even have the same number of degrees of freedom. For instance, in this model, if you go to very high energies, you see a gauge field uh, and also a complex scalar field. While in this model, you see only a complex scalar field. So the number of degrees of freedom doesn't match. That's point number one. Point number two, the number of coupling constants doesn't match. Here there is a one interaction, and sorry, here there is one interaction here and another interaction in the covariant derivative. But here there is only one interaction. The Feynman rules are not the same. Uh, these models are different. Nobody says that these models are equivalent. However, these models become the same only when you go to long distances. And the long distance theory is still non-trivial because there is a fixed point, a second order phase transition. So the statement is not that these models are exactly the same and magnetic vortices have exactly the same properties as these stable particles. The statement is only in some vicinity of the fixed point. The two models can be mapped to each other. So there is some vicinity of this fixed point where the physics of these models is very similar or identical. But it does not extend to the full phase diagram. These models are really different in general. Okay? This is what's called an infrared duality. Yes. The question is, what is the motivation for introducing a scalar field, a propagating scalar field? Well, uh, on the other side of the duality, in this effective field theory, the vortices, the, vort the bed vortices, these ones, they were dynamical objects. So you could create a vortex, anti-vortex, and they would move. So if you just had a free gauge field, like no H, then there won't be dynamical uh, particles, dynamical charged particles. There will be some charged particles. There will be classical, though. Uh, to have dynamical charged particles, you need to introduce a propagating charged particle to reproduce the physics in this side of the duality. Now, of course, you have to play. You could say, oh, how did I know that there is only one scalar field, not seven? So you just check with one, and if it works, you declare victory. You have to check. You have to guess. Nobody can prove it. It's a guess. 
but it passes many consistency checks. Yeah. H is not composite. H is elementary. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So the yeah the question is the uh, yeah the question is the uh, if it's important that the phase transitions order is first or is second. Well, to have non-trivial long distance, suppose you have this kind of suppose you have some other model in which the phase transition is uh, first order. So you have something like this. Then this, and then uh, this, okay? Some kind of picture like that. And then you go to the long distance limit. What do you see? Well, not much. Because uh, in, this vacuum, in all of this vacuum, all the correlation functions are exponentially small, so they vanish in the ordinary sense of the long distance limit. So there is a little bit here. There are two super selection sectors, and maybe a domain wall. So if you can match the number of super selection sectors and the properties of the domain wall, there is some kind of context to the infrared duality, but it's very little. When you have a conformal filter, it's much more because it's like an infinite set of scaling exponents and OP coefficients. Ah, the very good question. So. Yeah, yeah, there is a very good question here that uh, Sometimes in physics you hear the word universality and sometimes you hear the word duality. And the question is what's the difference or what's the connection? So I'll explain that point. It's an important terminological point. So universality is what uh, Mr. Uh, Wilson invented. Okay. Universality is something that was invented in the 70s, uh, mostly by Wilson who got the Nobel Prize for that. And universality is the following statement. So let's say that we are in the scalar model. I'm just writing again the scalar model Lagrangian. So this has the following phase transition between the, you know, uh, number, Gold, number Goldstone mode and trivially gapped phase. And there is an O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point. So Wilson invented the whole scaling hypothesis that operators that are irrelevant do not make an impact on the long distance physics. So therefore Wilson uh, would have said that you know if you added phi to the six or phi to the eight or any number of other terms, it would have not made an impact on the phase diagram because near the fixed point they all decay. The irrelevant operators decay near the fixed point because their coefficients go to zero. So universality means Universality means that if you have a complicated lattice model or a field theory with many relevant operators, the phase diagram is controlled by very few of those. The concept of duality is entirely different. It means that two completely different physical systems with different classical limits made out of different degrees of freedom can have the same long distance limit. They are not connected by a series of operators that decay to zero. They are made out of completely different fields. The Wilson hypothesis is about adding irrelevant operators to a given field theory. Duality is about starting out from completely different classical limits and arriving at the same quantum fixed point. Well, that's called duality, I would say. It's a, yeah. Universality is what Wilson, uh, yeah. Uh, universality is the statement that the higher, ter higher terms don't matter. And duality is the following statement. So, you know, the universe is quantum. So basically what, 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 what happens is that there is some quantum, quantum stuff, but then one quantum system can have different classical limits. So there might be a classical limit here. There might be a classical limit here. So we have one quantum model, which is the O2 Wilson Fisher interacting conformal field theory. But we found two different classical limits by adding various things. One is, the, uh, partic one is the phi to the four model. Okay, so one is the, uh, the xy model, xy model, which is that. And the other classical limit that we found was the uh, Higgs field coupled to a gauge field. So like a gauge field plus a Higgs field. These are two different classical limits because they both have an h bar going to zero. There is some, I mean, there is, 
H bar here is not defined because it's a quantum model. There is no H bar. H bar is something that appears when you start from a classical field theory and you quantize it. So here there is H bar one and here there is H bar two. But the quantum theory doesn't have H bar. Quantum theories don't know what is H bar. It's only classical limits that are quantized introduce a small parameter, right? So we have one notion of H bar in the XY model which is you just start by writing Feynman diagrams for the O2 model that defines H bar. And then there's another H bar that's defined in this model where you just start from a gauge theory coupled to some scalars and you quantize it. So you have two kinds of expansions in H bar. And the miracle is that they converge on the same quantum object. The quantum object is universal, but there may be diff many classical limits to the same quantum object. This is called duality. This is called universality. There is yet something else, which is that some people believe that there are very few quantum theories, just because they are so much constrained by consistency. So typically you expect that quantum theories have lots of lots of classical limits. Maybe we didn't discover many of them. What Wilson discovered is that each of those classical limits still it is, is kind of, you don't need to specify much about it, that all these things won't matter. That's what Wilson discovered, that each of the classical limits is kind of specified by just few parameters. But there may be lots of lots of classical limits to a given quantum system. The hypothesis that there are very few quantum systems is the underlying philosophy of the bootstrap. And so then in that perspective, duality is not surprising because there are very few quantum systems. Any other questions? Yes. Say again. I just can barely hear you. I don't know. I can't. I don't. The yes, the dictionary. Yes. What? The gauge theory is a particular classical limit that uh, has a well defined phase diagram. Is that the question? Yes. The, this is an infrared duality. So nobody claims that the physics here and the physics here is the same. The claim is that the physics here is the same. And that's near the phase transition where there is a non-trivial quantum model, the fixed point. So the duality is only valid near the transition. Now in this slide, the question uh, that Matteo asked about whether first order transitions also can lead to dualities is especially kind of annoying because here there is nothing almost except for maybe a domain one. So it's really a question of semantics at that point. Yes. Right. It's an excellent question. So the question is, what are the possible applications? Well, first of all, uh, there are constructions, like physical constructions, where the gauge theory description is a much, much better approximation. So let me give you an example. There is a phenomenon uh, that's called superconductivity, in which the wave function condenses. So the wave function has a non-zero norm in the vacuum. And in condensed matter, this, you know, this is described basically by uh, a Higgs mechanism. The wave function is like a charged particle in second quantization. And the phase of the wave function is a gauge field. And the condensation is achieved due to a potential for the Higgs field, very much like what appeared here at some point, this V of H. And you write a model. And then you ask, okay, what does this model do? You have a complicated gauge theory coupled to a Higgs field which started its life in first quantization as a Schrodinger wave function for the Cooper pairs, okay? And then uh, this is where the duality comes in because uh, you can say, oh, this model, I've already seen it before. Near the phase transition, it's the O2 model, okay? And then you say, okay, so there must be a phase transition between the superconducting phase. In th this would be called sometimes uh, the superconducting phase to some other phase, which is maybe insulating. And now you know a lot about the phase transition because you know the scaling exponents from all this work on Wilson Fisher models in the 80s and the 70s, the epsilon expansion and the bootstrap. So suddenly you have great predictions for the you know, insulator superconductor transition. That's one type of uh, application. Another type of application is that uh, in some of these constructions, especially starting from a superconductor, this U1 magnetic symmetry would not be maintained because many lattice models break the symmetry. So in fact, the Lagrangian in many of these condensed matter applications 
will have additional operators which break the magnetic symmetry. The operators that are charged under the magnetic symmetry are the monopole operators. So condensed matter theorists would often add monopole operators to the action to mimic what they see in the lattice because the symmetry is not present in many lattice constructions. And now you, this is extremely hard to analyze because as I told you, the monopole operator cannot be even expressed locally in terms of the underlying degrees of freedom. It's some complicated boundary condition. But using the duality, you can now like in one minute say everything because on the other side of the duality, this is like scalar field theory with some symmetry breaking term. Uh, let's say you could add x squared, where x is this x plus i y. So x is the real part of i. So that like the real part of i squared. Now this is trivial to analyze. I mean, it's an O2 model with some, uh, you know, silly quadratic piece. It's classical field theory. And you can easily analyze what happens to the phase transition. And for this particular deformation, it's like literally five minutes to convince yourself that this will turn into a, the Ising field theory. The O2 will turn into the Ising Wilson Fisher fixed point. And also about that, everything is known. So this statement of duality is useful because in some applications in condensed matter and in particle physics, one description is much more kind of natural from the other. But then once you have the duality, you have other descriptions that provide you with the answer for the quantum phase in a much more natural fashion. That's a one type of applications, but other than that, it's just an interesting general question in physics of, you know, to try to classify the possible quantum theories and which classical limits they've got. It's like a broader question that is essentially also very important in string theory. Yeah, like string theory is a very similar picture. You've seen that, but it's really the same. It's one quantum theory with many classical limits. Yeah, uh, any other questions before I? I forgot when I started, unfortunately. 11.45, I guess. Okay. <coughs> so what I want to do now, so if there are no more questions about particle vortex duality, yeah. What are the criteria for distinguishing good from bad? <laughs> it's a good uh, question in ethics. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> no, I, mean, I mean, maybe you have some context or completely, in some, can you say the context? Ah, in this sense, I thought like, <laughs> <laughs> in this context. No, this doesn't, this, um, uh, if you act on the vacuum with the gauge invariant, gauge non-invariant operator, you create like a charged particle. And as I told you, a charged particle in two plus one dimensions has infinite energy and it's not a good state in the Hilbert space. On the, and the same happens on the other side of the duality. You have a logarithmic divergence in the energy. The, so this is like an analogy. It's not really a part of the dictionary. So there are approximate configurations that could mimic this. Like you could have a box and then a charged particle would be okay. And also a vortex would be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, much more. We match the phases. Yeah. Yeah, so here, you see, so, I mean, in this analysis, one makes a lot of implicit assumptions. If you think about this picture deeply, there is no way to make consistency checks in the classical regime because the classical limit is very different. It's only this that agrees. But what I'm doing here is that I go to the classical limit and I check the phases. And I do the same here. And then I just cross my fingers that uh, the phases uh, will only transform to each other by one phase transition. It could be that there are seven phase transitions here in principle, and the other model has eight phase transitions, and none of them agrees. But one hopes that at least classically, the phases that you see are those phases between which there will be a phase transition. And then you're compelled to make a guess. There is no way to directly compare these theories at strong H bar. We can compute here at small h bar two, and here at small h bar one, but we're interested in h bar one equals h bar two equals one. And there is no way to make a computation, at least not with currently existing technologies. So one does what one can, and then one makes a conjecture and makes consistency checks. 
Now in supersymmetry, the reason that supersymmetry allowed to discover so many dualities is because there are many quantities that can be computed directly here, BPS quantities, that are independent of h-bar. That's how people made so much progress in the 90s in, in, in superstring theory and in supersymmetric duality. Because there were a bunch of quantities that you could just compute here, but they didn't change. And you could just compare. So if you start from here, and you start from here, and you get the same answer, you say, voila, okay? And here we cannot do that. There are some things we can compute which are independent of h bar, like topological invariance, or some what's called the SPT phases, which I'm not teaching you. But these are very few integers. And in the supersymmetric context, one could compute continuous functions, not just like three or four integers. So there are very few things that you can, like uh, Frances uh, Francesco is here, I saw him before. Yeah, so like if you look at Francesco's papers on this non-supersymmetric dualities, he computes some integers. There are like three integers you can compute, which do not change as a function of h bar. They are called SPT phases. And I do the same when I write papers on the subject. But it's just very few integers. And in the, the checks that you can do in supersymmetric gauge theories, you can compute partition functions. So we can do less, but the duality is not less true. In fact, this duality is more, is better verified than any supersymmetric duality because people put it on the lattice and check. Any other question? Yes, 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 most certainly, most certainly. Well, they compute the, they put the abelian Higgs model on the lattice, they vary the mass, and they find the phase transition. And they measure the critical exponents, and they see that the critical exponents are the same one that Wilson and Fisher computed for the O2 model. People were able to compute the critical exponent of H squared, and they saw that it's like 1.512 to three digits, exactly the same as the O2 model. It's very impressive. This case is better verified than any supersymmetric duality. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, next, what I wanted to teach was a little bit a more modern thing, which is uh, essentially the following. So here, the main point was that the, the main point was that there were these stable particles here in this language, and vortices, and there were some vortices in this language, the magnetic vortices. And physically, these magnetic vortices are just like particles with a little bit of magnetic flux, and they behave like ordinary particles. So if you take them around each other, there are no interesting phases. They behave like ordinary bosons. So what I want to teach now is generalizations of this duality for situations where these vortex particles behave like anions. Okay, so that's the next topic. Generalizations of this whole story for a situations where there are anions and Chern-Simons terms. So for that, what I'm gonna do now, I'll start teaching Chern-Simons theory for the next 15 minutes. I'll finish it tomorrow and give you the simplest generalization of this duality with Chern-Simons terms. And if I have five minutes tomorrow at the very end, I'll make contact with Young-Mills theory, the domain wall that we discussed at the beginning. So now we'll just discuss a billion Chern Simons. Here So this is going to be free field theory. And we'll just try to analyze that free field theory and then uh, do something more interesting with it. This is the action. So the churn simons coupling is here. And it's a particular it's a particular term that you can add only in two plus one dimensions. Now, one thing that's annoying about it is that the gauge field appears with no derivative, so you might be suspicious about gauge invariance. 
So let's check. The first sanity check is to uh, verify that this is gauge invariant. So you, you have to take a mu to a mu plus b mu of some omega. And this is clearly gauge invariant because this is an anti-symmetrized uh, thing. It's like the field strands. But this, uh, this piece looks, it gives you d mu omega, epsilon mu nu rho, and then d nu a rho. That, and now, of course, you just put the derivative on the other side, and it vanishes. So this is the total derivative. So as long as you're in infinite space with no boundaries, you don't have to worry. If you have boundary, you have to worry very, very, very much. But as long as you're in infinite space, you don't worry. So this is gauge invariant. And the question is about the physics of this model. It's a gauge invariant a field theory for a gauge field. Remember that without the chern simons term, this model was equivalent to a free compact scalar. Uh, but now it's not. There is no way that I know of to modify the compact scalar theory to include this k. And it's very, this, this term cannot be included in any way that I know in the compact scalar theory. So we cannot use that language anymore as soon as k is non-zero. So the remark number one was that it's gauge invariant. Remark number two is that k has to be quantized. It must be an integer. This is not so easy to see, but we'll do some computations soon. And you'll see that if this k is not an integer, you get some disease in the theory. So I'll derive that k is an integer from some computations that we'll do down the road. But for now, it may look mysterious why k has to be an integer. But it's got to be an integer. For non-integer k, this model makes no sense. You'll see why. OK, so the question is about the physics of this model. So remember that at k equals 0, the model had one massless particle. Uh, at k equals 0, we had one massless degree of freedom. Just one, mass, one, masses, one object that's moving at the speed of light. One, one quantum uh, moving at the speed of light. Now, for non-zero k, uh, I'll, I'll explain it soon. But the point is that there's one, still one degree of freedom. We haven't changed the number of degrees of freedom. But now it's massive. Now, when you have a massive degree of freedom in 2 plus 1 dimensions, like in any other number of dimensions, you can just go to the rest frame. Which go to the rest frame and ask what is the spin. So we have a particle. And we can ask what is the spin of the particle. We just rotate around it and ask what is the eigenvalue of the little group. So if k is positive, the spin of the particle is 1. If k is negative, it's minus 1. The spin in 2 plus 1 dimensions is just a real number. And in fact, it can be even a fraction as we'll see for anions. But this is not an anion. There are no, there's no, this particle is not an anion. It's a genuine propagating particle with integer spin. If k is positive, its spin is 1. It's, if k is negative, its spin is minus 1. Your most important homework exercise, perhaps, if you don't know these facts, the most important homework exercise for this uh, course is to compute the propagator. Compute the propagator in your favorite gauge, like C gauge. Try to use C gauge is convenient. Arc C gauge, I mean. And try to understand this fact. Now, there is a hint. I want to give you a small hint. When you do this computation in arc C gauge, you'll find also a pole at zero momentum. So you might think that there's still a massless particle. But that pole is spurious. And you can prove that that pole is spurious by computing the correlation function of f mu nu f rho sigma. And you'll see that that pole goes away. And uh, in this Green's function, all the poles are physical. And you can read out the quantum numbers very conveniently. And you can also read out the spin. So the effect of the chern simons term is that it makes the photon massive, which is very weird. It's without a Higgs mechanism. 
So it's a Higgs mechanism without a Higgs field. In the Higgs mechanism, however, you, I want to compare this with the Higgs mechanism. It's a source of many, many confusions. So I want to compare this mechanism of leading to, that leads to a massless particle with the Higgs mechanism. Just that you don't get confused because uh, this is something that uh, lots of people asked me about uh, various contexts. So uh, if you uh, study the same action, same action that we had before, you're in the Higgs phase. Let's say you're in the Higgs phase. So we have to, we have to uh, say how many degrees of freedom there are. So before we included the Higgs field, say the Higgs field is gone. There is one massless degree of freedom if the Higgs field does not condense. But now as we know from particle physics, when we are in the Higgs phase, there is another degree of freedom, the longitudinal mode, right? So in this model, in the Higgs phase, there are two degrees of freedom, which are massive. Not one. One is spin one, and the other is spin minus one. It's very different. In the Higgs mechanism, we take a massless gauge field and turn it into a massive thing, but now there are two degrees of freedom, spin one and spin minus one. And here, there isn't an additional degree of freedom. It's the same old a massless photon that becomes massive and it has either spin one or spin minus one, depending on the sign of k. Now this is of course consistent because parity reverses angular momentum. This model is invariant under parity. So these two things are related by parity. Because parity reverses angular momentum. But this is not invariant under parity. This breaks parity. So it's okay that there is only one excitation and there is no partner under parity. In fact, parity takes k to minus k. So it's good that for k positive, the spin is one, and for k negative, the spin is minus one. See, it's very different. People often call it an, uh, a Higgs mechanism without a Higgs field, but it's not. It's entirely different. Okay. Okay, the next thing about it, I have five more minutes, is, okay, so, is the physics of this model, long distance physics. Question, the central question is, what is the long distance physics what is the long distance physics of the model with non-zero k? About zero K, we already know everything. So the first naive answer to this question is that the long distance physics is trivial because there is only a massive particle. There is nothing massless. So the naive answer is that it's trivial because there are no massless particles. This is the naive answer. In fact, this answer is incorrect. This model has non-trivial long distance limit even though there are no massless particles. You remember that in the first course, in the first session, I gave you a classification of phases and there was one element there that was non-trivially gapped. It's a gapped model, but it has non-trivial physics in the infrared in the form of anions, probe anions, probe particles which are anions. So this is the naive answer, this is incorrect. The correct answer is that it's non-trivially gapped. So even though there are no massless particles, even though there are no massless particles, let me just write it down, it's perhaps the most important thing here if you don't know that. Even though there are no massless particles, there are pro particles which are very heavy that lead to our own of bomb phases which are measurable even at long distances. There are pro particles, so the pro particles themselves are very heavy. They're like classical sources, like this J mu. So these probe particles, they come from coupling A mu to J mu classical. Okay, we'll discuss it now in a lot of detail. So there are classical sources for the gauge field. 
uh, which behave like anions. Behave like anions and they lead to our own of bond phases. A, B phases. So even though the model has no actual fluctuating field at long, fields at long distances, some probe objects behave like anions. And of course, you can anticipate that in the future, we will want to make these anions dynamical. We will want to second quantize these anions. So far, they will be just first quantized or even classical. But then we want to second quantize them. And so uh, they could fluctuate. So it's important to understand the classical limit first before we second quantize it. Okay, so what we have to understand is uh, the response of this theory to, to classical sources. So let me just write the equation and then we adjourn. So that's what we're going to study tomorrow. So uh, taking this model and adding classical sources, we lead to some Euler-Lagrange equations which are like generalizations of the Maxwell equations. The Euler-Lagrange equations that you'll get for this model would look like d mu, I'm just writing them qualitatively for a second, d mu f mu nu plus epsilon a nu rho sigma f rho sigma equals j nu, and here there will be a k. And here there might be a g squared. This is, this is the qualitative form of the equations of motion that you'll get when you write the other Lagrange equations for the system. And this is just a classical function. It's not quantized. So if somebody gives you a distribution of charges and you find the electromagnetic fields, like you did in school, okay? Uh, these equations are a little bit too complicated to analyze. And in fact, we don't need the first term. That's what I wanted to argue. We don't need the first term to understand the physics of these anions because uh, it has two derivatives, while this has one derivative. So this is more important at long distances. So if you want to understand macroscopic phases, you can throw away the first term. So in fact, we will simplify these equations to just, uh, to just the, uh, the first, the, to just k over four pi so these are the, this is actually the equation that we're going to solve. Epsilon mu nu rho, F nu rho equals J mu classical. So this is the equation that we're going to study. It's a highly non-standard equation. Uh, you don't, you're not used to electromagnetic fields with a linear response. You're used to electromagnetic fields with a second derivative response. So there are waves. But of course, it's not surprising that it's a first derivative equation that it's a first order equation, because as I told you, there are no waves, there are no massless particles. This model is completely gapped, it's tr non-trivially gapped, so there are no waves, and so the equation is of the first order. And so the plan is to just take a distribution of charges, solve this equation, and compute our own of bound phases. Then we will establish the existence of anions in this model. Then we will second quantize the anions, and get generalizations of particle vortex duality with the magnetic vortices that are anionic. 